Welcome to Brandstorm, the podcast that talks to the people behind America's brands. I'm Dan Trzinski, president of Platypus Advertising and Design. And I'm Nancy Christopher, PR director at Platypus. If you want to start making video a part of your marketing plan, our guest today has a few ideas that will help you even if you are new at it. Rick Cesari is joining us to talk about video marketing insider secrets. He's a pioneer of direct response marketing and has helped build brands like Sonicare, The Rug Doctor, The George Foreman Grill, and OxyClean from scratch. Welcome to Brandstorm, Rick. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Hey, Rick. I got to tell you, before we even start, you're probably the cause of so many sleepless nights because I'm like the infomercial addict. <laughs> and I've owned more George Foreman grills, steak knives, so many things that I've suckered into. It's addicting. You know, but it's addicting. I love infomercials. Yeah. No, that's that's good to hear. Sometimes when I give my talks, I ask people, does anyone watch infomercials? And nobody, you know, there could be 200 people in the room and nobody raises their hand, but somebody must be buying all the products right. that we sell. Nobody, no, no question. No one nobody wants, to, wants admit to admit it. it right? yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm also a fan of the hawkers at like state fairs and stuff like that. The guys selling you chamois and knives and all that stuff. I fall for all. And of the that. special mop. Yeah, they're the original pitchmen. <laughs> right. They're, they're the ones that they learn their craft very well. And kind of what I did in my career was just kind of take the concept of that one-on-one pitch and then use television as like a giant magnifying glass to get it in front of more people. Yeah, get it and to scale, right? Yeah. You know, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. there's certainly some household names that. Everybody knows. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. So I'll just give you a a quick overview. I actually graduated uh, college with a degree in biology. And obviously, it's like my plan was to go into dental school. A friend in in high school and I talked about it. I got tired of uh, school, so I went back down to Florida and became a a little bit of a bum for a year. My mom wasn't too happy about that. I was a bartender and a lifeguard. But I started reading a lot of books about how people made money. And at the time, and still today, a lot of people were becoming millionaires by investing in real estate. And so I started reading books and investing in real estate and buying some houses. And I went to a seminar and the guy taught me how to go out and buy a piece of distressed property and turn around and sell it. And I was 23 at the time and I made like $12,000 in two weeks. And that was the most money I'd ever seen in my entire life. and Yeah, that's I, huge back then. Too yeah, and so I was grateful. And you'll appreciate this from a PR standpoint, Nancy, is I called up a, a business magazine in Florida at the time where I was living called Florida Trend. And I said, hey, you have to interview this guy. It's amazing. And they did a story on him and it kind of helped his seminar business get off the ground. So he asked me if I wanted to help him with the marketing. And that's how I, I got into direct to consumer marketing. And just to give you a time frame, we were promoting these real estate seminars with newspaper ads. So that sure. shows you how long ago it was. But, you know, one of the things I try to hammer home to people that I talk to is, you know, human nature doesn't change. And so it, you might be using uh, newspaper ads, radio ads, TV ads, online ads, Facebook ads. If you understand the underlying concepts of what people respond to, all these technology are just delivery platforms. Right. And you really need to know what makes the consumer respond. And then that gives you a leg up on everybody else. I've always said it, and I've gotten that question for over 30 years. What's the best form? It's like all media's work. It's not the media. It's the message. Hey, that's absolutely right. But you're really successful on video. What makes it so powerful as a marketing tool? Well, you know, there's lots of statistics about that and some great online statistics. People retain, when people see something with a video, uh, they retain 95% of it as opposed to if they just read it in a text. Um, We've really become... Uh, a video first society. I think in the last 30 days, another statistic that's in my book, Video Persuasion, we've produced as a society more video in the last 30 days than all the major TV networks have produced in the last 30 years. And the ability of the technology, cell phones and things like that to help create video. Unfortunately, I don't think this is a good thing. People just don't read or don't like to read. And video is a much easier way for people to gain information. Yeah, I'm raising my hand. Absolutely. I mean, you grew up, you know, grew up as the television generation, you know, mm-hmm. in the 60s, 70s. I don't know if you call that the golden age of television anymore. But now I, I can't think of a program that I watch on network television, but I'm a YouTube junkie. You know, I mean, I'll watch do-it-yourselfers and how to do this. I want to change the oil in my tractor or something like that. And, and then I find myself just going sideways throughout YouTube and watching more and consuming more video content. It's amazing. Going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Deeper and deeper. yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> so let's start with some basics. What are the key components of a technically great video? Okay, so there's a couple answers to that. When I was in my 20s, uh, I was living in Daytona Beach, and I took a course called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. You guys have probably oh, sure. read the book yep. or I've heard of that book. I read the book, yes. He had a formula for giving a speech, a very simple formula. Tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. And I know this seems really simple, but I use that formula over and over again. But I go into a lot more depth in the book. Um, I compare making videos a lot like giving speeches or giving presentations and how the things you have to do to capture or engage the viewer at the very beginning so they don't turn out or don't, you know, when you're skimming through uh, TV or skimming through YouTube videos, how do you capture that viewer's attention? And there's a lot of tricks you can learn from being a good public speaker that you can use in video production as well. And so I, I talk a lot about those, but that's one real simple formula I like to talk about. You mentioned your book before, Video Persuasion. You talk about four steps. Is that the uh, four-step formula for anybody that's creating videos for Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all those social platforms? Is, is that similar to those steps yeah, you just no, talked absolutely. about? Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, and in, in, in being in advertising, you might have heard about this, but it, it's a formula that I call AIDA. I, I never pronounce it right. Uh, capital <laughs> A, capital formula. I, capital A -I -D -A. B, capital yeah. A. Yeah. Right. Uh, and it isn't my formula. I've, I actually have have used it. And, and it really stands for the capital A is capture the person's attention. And like I said, I talk about three, three different ways, and there's many different ways you can do that at the beginning of a video. Once you have their attention, you, you build their interest, you arouse the desire, that's the D in the formula, and then you motivate them to take action. And I think that's one of the biggest things that most people leave out in their videos. And you have to understand when I'm talking about the videos that I make, they aren't for necessarily for entertainment or to amuse or, or social videos and you know pictures of the family vacation. I'm talking about videos you can use for your business to generate leads, to create more sales, to help build the brand. And so one of the things that many people leave out of that type of video is some type of call to action at the end of the video uh, where you're basically telling the viewer what you want them to do with the information you've just given them. You know, you mentioned earlier, you look at a lot of tutorial videos on YouTube and, you know, it's always a good idea then if, you know, if you want more information, go to our website. Um, right. If you're interested in buying this product, go to Amazon. And it really just simple, just having some type of uh, simple call to action at the end of the videos is really, really powerful way of getting people to respond. Yeah, I like that formula and the one you talked about before as far as the tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Say it. Then you know, right, say it all that yes. stuff. And you see that formula in infomercials a lot, you know, where it seems repetitive, but I think our attention spans today are just so short. You know, I'm the victim also of the command module. I'm in the recliner. I've got an iPad, a laptop, the big screen mm -hmm. TV in front of me, and I'm watching four things at one time. So even though as a producer, you might feel like you're looking at the script saying, well, this seems repetitive. It's probably not, correct? Oh, it's it's not. <laughs> and, and, you know, for a lot of reasons, if you, you know, if you're talking about TV, which again, you know, viewership's it's still a good medium, but viewership's definitely declining. People are watching more things online. But in a TV world, people have that remote control and they can just flick away or nobody actually looks at their TV guide on their TV and says, oh, I'm going to tune into that infomercial. Uh, people just are clicking around the station and they happen to hear something that's of interest to them. And if if it is, then they'll listen for a little bit. And if it is, you know, if it is interesting, if it's a solving a problem that they might have, They'll listen to the end of the of the show or the commercial, however long that might be, and then make a buying decision at that time. Yeah, it just sucks you in. I know, like, can't remember if this was the rug doctor where you just kept adding different things Dirt. to throw on the floor and it picks yeah. up right away. And, it's and like, you know, the reason we wow. do that is very, very simple. Uh, there's viewers out there and, you know, one viewer might have a wine stain. Another one might have pet stains. Another one, you know, might have uh, dirt or mud from kids tramping it in. And when you resonate with that one problem that the viewer has, they're going to respond to it. So you try to cast as wide a net as possible in a video like that. So in your book, Video Persuasion, you have a lot of great insights from experts, big guys in the business. Can you share some of the insights that you love the most? 
Yeah, so um, I, that was one of the more, more fun parts of the book for me is I picked out 10 different people that I had worked with over the last several years and interviewed them at the end of each chapter. You know, besides the information in the chapter, there's some really cool interviews of people that are using video in their business to make a sale, to build their brand. And, you know, give you a couple examples. Uh, one gentleman named Paul Miller, and he invented a product for kids called Cozy Phones. And basically, they're like a, a cloth headband and they have um, earphones in there and kids would put them on and, and use them in the car or use them to go to sleep. And he started doing some licensing deals and, you know, with some major toy type companies and, and got toy figures. But he talks about how he used Facebook ads to grow his business. And he did something really interesting. He made a very, very inexpensive Facebook ad just based on his own knowledge and experience. And he used a, an online app, and I talk about this in the book called Lumen5, which allows you to basically just place pictures and they put together the music and the audio. And he built that spot for less than $500 and it generated over a million dollars in sales. So then he got, he said, well, I'm gonna go out, I'm, I'm gonna do this first class, and I'm gonna hire a production agency and we're gonna make a really slick looking commercial and he spent $20,000 and it was a total failure. And that goes back to what we mentioned earlier that the messaging is more important than the technical look of a video. And that's a, an important lesson to learn is that your messaging, the content of the video is more importantly than making it technically look good. And, and he points that out. There's another guy, there's a firm out here in Seattle founded by a guy named Jeff Turley, and he has a company called Go Net Yourself. And basically you can pay them $3,000 and they'll create half a dozen videos for you. And they have a three camera studio. And he talks about how best to interview testimonials and guests when they come in there. And then one important point is when you're doing these interviews, something that will enhance your video production is always get transcripts made. And, you know, there's very simple online places that'll do it for pennies on the dollar, something called rev.com, rev.com, that where if you do an interview with someone or testimonials, if you get transcripts made, it makes it really easy when you're editing the interview back together. Another guy I interview is Bernie Thompson. He runs a $30 million Amazon business that sells computer peripherals. Um, it's called Pluggable. And he talks about how from day one, he made a video for every new product that he introduces. And these are very similar to the tu tutorial videos you mentioned yep, earlier yep. on YouTube. And by explaining these products and how they work and how they connect has really enhanced his business. And, and so that goes on and on like that of how people out there in the marketplace right now today are using video in their own businesses to have a lot of success. I'm a sucker for that too. I, I see myself on Amazon, you know, when you see the pictures of the product on the side, if they've got a video on there, I'm always clicking on it because you see somebody else using the product and you get a feeling of scale, weight, you know, how it's being used. How does it look when it's coming out of the box? You know, how do you put it together? All those things I think are so, so much part of the selling process today. You know, I agree. And then just the fact that you're actually seeing a person use it as opposed to a sterile product shot right. enhances conversions. Absolutely. And again, it goes back to the power of video. You just said it versus just a plain uh, picture on, on many Amazon listings. So I work with a lot of larger Amazon sellers and always encourage them to start incorporating video just for the reasons that, that you mentioned. Those stagnant diagrams you know, where A goes into right, A right. and no, B no, no, goes into no. BB. Uh, that's so confusing. And, and if I don't have that, if I get something that, that I get out of a box that I've got, a, that's where I go back to YouTube again, too. That, okay, yeah. I, instead of opening up the instructions, more than likely, almost anything that you buy, somebody's put a YouTube video together on their own, even if they're a private party, not the business themselves. Hey, here's how you unbox this thing. Here's how you plug it together and watch it. And I'm, again, more visual learner than I am about reading an instruction manual. Right. And whenever you have any questions, Google it. Yep. Two, two important points there on Amazon ads. We steal something from uh, video production. When I tell people that even when they're doing just the pictures, one of the things I'm encouraging Amazon sellers to do is add infographics to their pictures, calling out 
the the benefits of the product. Right. So instead of just seeing a plain picture there, you might say, well, if you use this widget, it'll help you do this. And you should make every one of those little listings like a little miniature magazine ad, and you'll have much better conversions. Another tip I would give people that, and I'll see if you agree with me or not, but you mentioned something about the quality of video, and I know you can, you know, the new iPhone has got a great camera on it, and probably mm -hmm. better than some professionals and stuff. But I always say, it, you know, just because I own a chisel doesn't make me a sculptor. You know, you've got a great <laughs> tool, but audio, and we're here on a podcast right now. I mean, audio and the quality of audio, I think, is as important, or even maybe sometimes more important. I'll put up with poorer video quality as long as I can hear it. But if you're out in a windy, bad audio, hissy, stuff like that, I won't watch it. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. And, you know, when we were talking a little bit earlier about creating, quote unquote, a technically good video, really the two areas that separate a professional video person from someone at home using their iPhone is they have some type of professional microphone that right. does deliver good audio. And to be honest with you, you can get decent microphones for $39, $49. I list some of these in the book. And then also the second one, which is not quite as important, but again, the difference between that next level of video is just a simple lighting. And they, again, yes. they have simple ring lights or lights that are designed that with, with your iPhone that will hold an iPhone. It's just a single light. And if you put those two things together, a very simple lighting and very simple audio, and again, you can do that for under $100, all of a sudden you've raised your video game tremendously. Do you have any other tips on how you can save money making videos without losing the quality of the video or making the video suffer from that? Yeah, first of all, we've been talking about this, that technology has allowed people to really, the quality of the technology with iPhones and Androids, whatever, the, the cameras and the video in there has really just given people tremendous amount of ability to make their own videos. If you follow a couple tips like we were just talking about, but you know, the other thing that's happening, and this is that people are almost getting used to social media videos where they aren't necessarily slickly produced. And so the, to me, there's always like a fine line between, because if someone sees something, I think that's a little too slick, they say, oh, that's an advertisement right. and, they're, and they, don't, they don't stay tuned into it. And so the more authentic looking you can make it, the better. And I'll give you a great example. One of my favorite places to pick up uh, authentic testimonials is going to a trade show booth. So if you have a client that's selling a product or a service and they have a trade show booth and you're there and then they have people coming up to the booth and you have a camera or your iPhone or whatever right right in front and you're interviewing these people, you see it's, it's a real background, they aren't fake testimonials and you get a real authentic feel to what you're doing. But then get around to, to answer your question, Nancy, I list about 10 different apps in the book that, again, talking about how technology has changed video production, you know, if you were to hire a professional crew in the old days, you really couldn't walk out the door for under $10,000. And obviously now I list a lot of online apps. I've mentioned a couple of them, but give you an example, something like Content Samurai or Lumen5, where you can just download this app and it allows you to make really high quality videos just using the, the tools that you have at home. So in addition to making great videos and direct response and becoming a pioneer in that, you also do a lot of speaking engagements. What do you like to talk about at these appearances? Yeah, so I have a few things uh, that I talk when I'm when I get invited to do different talks. To give you an idea, I've, kind of, I've done uh, several keynote talks. Like one, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a guy named Dan Kennedy. He passed away recently, and he wrote a couple books called The No BS Guide to Direct Response Marketing. Anyway, he has a, a, a an organization for small business called GKIC, and they had me come in and basically talk about how to build a $100 million business using direct response marketing. You guys are branders, so you know I have a, a talk where the five keys to building a great brand uh, my previous book to Video Persuasion, which came out last year, was called Building Billion Dollar Brands because four of the products I've worked for ended up reaching a billion dollars in sales. And that was the George Foreman Grill, the Sonicare, OxyClean, and the GoPro camera. And the GoPro camera is a great story to kind of tie the, all the video together and a lot of the techniques we've been talking about today. 
I met the founder of the company. I mentioned trade shows. I was down at the outdoor retailing trade show in Salt Lake City, and uh, there was this guy down there, and he had his Volkswagen bus on the trade floor, flow show, the trade floor show, trade show floor. <laughs> I know <laughs> Sorry what you're about that. To say. A tongue twister, <laughs> right. um, because he couldn't afford a booth, and so he basically threw some sand on the ground, and he had a beach chair, and he was selling these. He was a surfer back by background. His name was Nick Woodman, and he was the founder of GoPro. And I said, "Hey, this is a great product. We should, you know, do something." He flew up to Seattle a couple weeks after the show, and we sat down, and he laid out to me his strategy for how he was going to build this little camera business into a billion-dollar business, and so. I have to give him credit for having that foresight. But the commercial, we did all the television marketing for GoPro. And one of the things I like to talk about are those ads where every ad began with a GoPro logo. So you knew exactly what the ad was going to be about. Remember, tell them what you're going to say. And then in the middle, we would use user-generated footage. So people that would be snowboarders or people that would jump out of airplanes or scuba divers would send us footage. We would take that actual footage and use that as the body of the commercial. But then at the end, we did have an offer. We said, go to our website, someone will win one of everything thing we make every single day. And so three, three great things happened. People would go to the website and they'd leave us their name and email address to register for the contest. And we were able to remarket to them and build a database. The second neat thing that happened was people would go to the website, they'd see all the other cool GoPro videos and they'd share them with their friends and create a viral effect. And third was more of a traditional direct response. They would get to the website and they would purchase the cameras creating a revenue stream, which offset the advertising. So that was kind of the basic model we used to help them grow from under a million to about a billion in sales in only eight years. It must be great working with these entrepreneurs because, you know, I've sat there so many times in my life and thought, if I could only invent something yeah. you know, <laughs> like that, you know, ponytail twirl thing that <laughs> just made so much money. But these are impressive people that come up with these ideas. I know. Yeah, do you get a lot of startups like that? I mean, I mean, GoPro is a great story. I mean, it's a brand I've followed for quite a while. But do you get the other goofy person that f seeks you out and finds out you're a direct response to the guy and they've come up with, you know, a better scrunchie like Nancy wants to? Yeah. Yeah, I get a, I, I get a lot of those. And you know what? I have to be honest with you. You know, if I look at the sweet spot for people that I can help or companies that I can help, it's somebody that's actually already invented a product that's different than anything out in the marketplace, you know, the unique selling proposition, they can right. differentiate from their competition, but they've also got a small level of sales already. So it's not a brand new product that we're kind of market testing. The consumer is already purchasing it. And so what then I can do is come in and use some of these mass marketing concepts with video and then help expand the sales and the uh, brand awareness. But there almost has to be a proof of performance that's happened already mm -hmm. for, for you to take that on. Because I, I, again, in my 30 years, I've had a number of startups where the, the inventor finds you and comes to you with the idea that they haven't made one, they haven't sold one, but this would be a great infomercial. And this is how many people are going to come up with. I'm not even going to mention some of the products. Oh, yeah. No, I usually send know, those people off to they uh, might product be developers that I know and, and say, come back in six months when you have some sales. Yeah. He's like Shark Tank behind the scenes. Right. I love that show, too. <laughs> oh, that's one of my favorites. I love watching the... I don't know. I just... I've always... Um, you know, you mentioned before the podcast started that you guys work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And for whatever reason in my career, I don't necessarily seek it out, but I've always ended up working with smaller level entrepreneurs. And then um, if they had the right product or service that people really like, you know, was able to help build them, build up the business. And it's... Uh, fun working with sure. with different entrepreneurs and you know seeing their motivation yeah, and their passion their passion that's a great word yeah absolutely and you've obviously got an eye for finding that type of entrepreneur too because you've taken the ones that you've selected to new levels did George Foreman really invent the grill, or is that, is that a licensing deal? Or, you, or is that a secret that you can't tell? No, it's not a secret. I'll tell you okay. that's a fun story too because I had started a company in 1989 called uh, Trillium Health Products. We marketed the Juice Man Juicer and the Bread Man Bread Machine. And we were in the right time at the right place with the right product. And that company grew to 75 million in sales in only four years. And we got bought in 1993 by a company in Chicago called Salton Housewares. So Salton came back to me. Um, they liked the way we did the marketing. 
and they had two products. One was a homemade bagel maker, and the other thing was a slanted grill, which they had tried to market as a fajita maker. And the idea was it was slanted because they would cook ground meat in it, put their taco shell on the edge of it, and then scrape the meat into it. And obviously it didn't sell very well. So we had to kind of reposition that product. And, it, and George Foreman at the time had just won the heavyweight championship for the second time. He was the oldest person ever to do it. He was 46 years old. And his agent was looking for a product for him to endorse because he had always had a reputation of kind of being a bully and not as friendly as right. we know him today. And so we just made that connection. We were able to get started with him. And they, you know, Sultan made a deal with George where they would split the net profits on the grill. And I think over the course of the of the deal, George made one hundred and thirty million dollars off of the endorsement for the George Foreman Grill. Wow. Lucky George. Yeah, that was that was another one at the right place at the right time. Exactly. Well, I could sit here and listen to your stories all day long, but obviously we have to bring all these good things to an end, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So what's the best way to connect with you either personally or to set up an appearance or to get a copy of one of your books? So the best uh, thing to do is go to my website, which is rickcesari.com, R-I-C-K-C-E-S-A-R-I. And I actually have an, a free download for people that talks about the three most engaging types of video content, online video content that you can use. But, you know, my uh, information on, on my book, Video Persuasion, will be released on Amazon on October 15th. And any information that we've been talking about today is there. I do a, a, a weekly blog, and I have a YouTube channel, which is rickcesari.tv. So the best place to start is at my website, and then all the information will be there as far as uh, finding my books. Great. We'll try to get this up before October 15th. Absolutely. Hey, that would be awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for all your insight. It's It's been a pleasure talking with you. I love all the products you've been involved with. And if I ever have somebody that's really wanting to do an infomercial or something like that, again, you're going to get a phone Rick. call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I would really appreciate that. And also coming back the other way is I've run into a lot of different uh, companies and businesses. And if I can send some business your way, I'd, I'd be, love to do that. All oh, right. that'd be so nice of you. Okay. So <laughs> to our listeners, if you have any questions for Dan or me about today's episode, please Feel free to contact us on our LinkedIn pages. And if you like what you've heard today, please don't forget to share, review, and subscribe to Brandstorm. We really appreciate your support. This is Dan Trzinski along with Nancy Christopher at Platypus Advertising and Design, an awesome company that creates perceptions that influence choice. We hope you'll join us next week for another episode of Brandstorm. Brandstorm.